Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 94, Sean Goodsell, High Performance Mastery. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pedlight. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we hear how the most successful top professionals are conducting themselves today and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person, off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. My next guest is Sean Goodsell from The Mental Edge. When I tried to think about how long I've known Mr. Goodsell, if my memory is correct, it's coming up on 20 years now. Coach Sean and The Mental Edge have coached, trained, and mentored close to 2,000 students, clients over the years. They've been empowering people to experience heightened and sustained levels of confidence, clarity, and courage to propel them to live a life that they really could not conceive of prior to their experience. Their clients include professional athletes, sales professionals, business owners, concerned parents, and individuals desiring to improve all aspects of their lives. This is perfect timing to have Mr. Goodsell on the show, since most youth winter hockey seasons have wrapped up for the year, so preparation and planning for what you want to accomplish for next season should be thought about and decided upon fairly quickly. That's enough with this intro, let's get the party started. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Sean Goodsell to the show. Mr. Goodsell, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Uh, It's an honor, Lance. Thanks for inviting me. Well, that's a little formal for for this little podcast here, but I I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, thanks for being here. You're you're in a, a little different environment now you live out in uh, north carolina you know i spent i spent a good portion 50 years of my life living in minnesota and my wife and i just thought you know it's time to go somewhere where we don't experience the pain of winter so we moved to north carolina about eight years ago and we've been here ever since awesome well uh before we get to how you're currently helping people become the best versions of themselves uh, let's go back to the beginning. Where'd you grow up? What was your childhood like? We know that it's going to be in Minnesota, but we don't know what your childhood like. Uh, your introduction to hockey. I don't even know if you played hockey and other sports, your siblings, friends, parents, basically tell the listeners what it was like growing up Sean Goodsell. Well, <clears throat> first thing that I, that I tell people is that I'm an adopted first child who grew up in Northeast Minneapolis. Okay. Uh, so I went to a Catholic grade school and had the opportunity at the time that it was time to decide to go to high school to go either public or stay like at a school like Tatino. Or I decided to go to St. Anthony Village High School, and I was a th- I, I played just about every sport you could growing up. Uh, I I played basketball, I played football, I played hockey, I played tennis, I played. You know, soccer. I mean, everything that you could play, I played. I just loved sports. And so sports was a really important part of my growing up years. And as I got older, sports became the way that I managed a lot of my personal problems. My family was not, you know, a real functional family. I had a brother that was a raging alcoholic at the age. I learned that about the age of 13. Uh, Parents got divorced. There was always family conflict. So I was a real anxious, depressed mess for a lot of my, at least my high school years. And sports were my therapy. They were the way that I handled life. 
they, those were sports was where I met some of the most important mentors of my growing up years. And I, I, I tell you right now that sports pretty much saved my life growing up. And those people that mentored me, those coaches, those uh, mentors that came in other places, they became my surrogate parents. And if it weren't for those people right now, I don't think I'd still be talking to you right now, Lance. So you're saying that it was so bad that you had suicidal thoughts? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, there were many nights where I sat in my room contemplating how I was going to end my own life. And, and the problem with, with me was you, never would have, you would have never known that had you had talked to me. I was one of those kids that looked good on the outside said all the right things, tried really hard, had good relationships with his teachers, never really rebelled because my brother was doing all that. So I could kind of hide behind his, his, you know, raging alcoholism. So yeah. I was a silent, depressed kid. And, and yeah, there were many nights where I wondered if my life was worth continuing. Well, that had to be tough and you didn't have... Uh, since your parents split up, did you have either one of those that you could confide in to, to help you a little bit, get through that time? I think my parents, you know, my mom, I think was just very, very broken from being in a marriage where she didn't receive much encouragement or much nurturing from my dad. My dad was a military type. He, uh, he retired as a full colonel in the National Guard. And it, despite... I think good intentions, both of them were just very unskilled in their ability to meet the needs of kids, an adopted first child, and then their other two children that, that really challenged them in their parenting skills. And I think both of them cared about us. They loved us. They just didn't know how to parent. Yeah. So when you were playing all these sports, uh, probably being at home was some place that you avoided. Did you spend a lot of time in the neighborhood playing tennis on, you know, at the park and baseball and stuff like that? So there were three places that became my places of rest. I would go up to the local ice rink and I used to hate when it was, 30 to 32 degrees and above because I was afraid they were going to close the rink. And so whether it was 10 below zero or whatever the, I would pack my, pack my lunch, <clears throat> go up to the rink, spend the whole day at the rink, leave when it shut down. And I'd do that as many days as I possibly could. And so that was one of my places of refuge. Uh, I used to take a tennis ball and a tennis racket and go up to the high school and hit it for hours against the side of the side of the building. Yeah. And then the third place that became a really, you know, powerful place for me was my bedroom. I would uh at at the age of 16 I had a very profound spiritual experience in my bedroom where I really felt like something real supernatural happened in my life and helped to uh guide me in in a really positive direction. That was when things started to turn around for me. Uh, in ways that I could have never predicted. But those were the three areas that became my really, really uh, places of therapy, if you will. How were you uh, doing in school at the time when you're going through all this? Because that can become a struggle. Was that an, another place of refuge, like reading books and stuff? I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a great student. I worked really hard in school, but I wasn't a great learner. I think if we were to you know have the technologies available that we have now for uh, you know assessing kids i think i had dyslexia mm -hmm. and i think adhd would have been a very prominent diagnosis for me so i had a real hard time learning so it took me like twice as long to learn what it took most people half the time to learn so i worked really hard i was a good student from the perspective of i cared about my studies but I wasn't a good performer on tests or anything like that. So you go, you get through high school. Um, what sports did you play in high school? All of them still? 
I played, uh, I ran cross country because I wanted to train for hockey. So I ran cross country, uh, played hockey. And then up until my junior year, I played baseball. And then my senior year, I played tennis. Gotcha. And was there any college in the future for you for a sport? Uh, there wasn't any kind of like recruiting process that went on. Uh, I w there was a specific college that I wanted to go to because I didn't want to go where uh, where partying was the central reason to go to college. So I went to a small liberal arts college called Bethel. And, and I went there, or I wanted to go there because I knew that I would be surrounded by some people that would help me feel like I was a part of a community. High school was hard for me. I had sports teams I was a part of, but I was a loner. I stayed, I spent a lot of my evenings and weekends at home. And that's why the hockey rink became my refuge. Um, <clears throat> but I applied to go to Bethel. And because my, my grades and my standardized test scores were so low, my school counselor told me that I should just give up the idea of going to college and learn a trade. And I wasn't having any of that. So to make a long story short, I applied three different times to go to Bethel, got rejected three different times until I made an appeal to the, to the dean of students to, to go there. And the cross-country coach went in on my behalf and said that he would vouch for me. And the fourth application, I was accepted as a, as a provisional student assuming that I would hold a certain level of academic performance to stay in the school. So four different application processes before I even got accepted. And then it, it happens. Uh, <laughs> with, <laughs> what has been so constant with all these interviews that uh, I've had is that there, there's been always someone other than a parent. I mean, it happened to me a few times where someone said something, to you or someone went to bat for you or someone uh, just gave you an opportunity and it completely changed your trajectory? I had three people, Lance, that literally saved slash changed my life. I had a, I had a, a mentor when I was in high school. His name was Paul Lindbergh. He, he basically invited me to his house for Christmases. He, he took me on as, I mean, he was a college student at the time, and he took me out every week, bought me a salad at Perkins, invited me to his family functions, invited me to church functions. And that was, that was the first mentor that, that ever just really spoke into my life. And then my cross-country coach in college, and then a few other people, those people – they never asked for anything in return. And one time I asked my, my mentor in high school, I go, what can I do? And he goes, and, and, and I think you'll come back around to this when we talk later on about some things. But he said to me, Sean, all I care about is that you pay it forward. Yeah. That's all he said. Just, awesome. Just pay, just pay it forward, Sean. Yeah. And I've spent the better part of the last 30 years of my life trying to pay it forward. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty powerful concept, isn't it? I can, yes, very I can hear you get, I can hear you getting emotional right now. You know? Yeah. Um, it is emotional because, you know, when I think of, when I think of all, I don't know, I've counted to the best. I've spent over 20 some thousand hours in individual conversations with all sorts of different people. I've worked with over 1,800 different hockey players over 20, 20-some 20 years. And every one of them has a story. You know, every one of them has a point of pain, and every one of them has a point of – they have a dream. They have a, a possibility that they're pursuing. And I feel like I owe it to everybody that I have the opportunity to work with to help them in the ways that the people that helped me, you know, helped me get going and get on track with my life. So you mentioned that you have three. You talked about Paul Lindbergh. Who are the other two? There was uh, um, the second one was uh, a guy named Mike Frejo, and he was a football player at Buffalo at the time, and then a, a lady by the name of Deb Rose. Um, 
those three people virtually, you know, took me under their wing and mentored me and cared for me and confronted me at times and challenged me and taught me. And it was, it was, I felt like it was like a miracle in many ways that these people had the vision that they had for me and they, and then they sacrificed, you know, they did things for me that they didn't have time to do this stuff. They had other priorities they were doing and they still made time for me. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, Cause it, you know, as a college student or a high school student, you don't, you don't really realize what the, the world is and how many, you know, how many inputs are out there <laughs> that are yeah. are coming at you from all different angles. Um, you know, and it, once you become a, a parent, you know, you get married, I mean, it, it just doubles and uh, sometimes you get so busy, you just shut people off and you don't even recognize the signal when you're in a room with someone that might be in need of a, a little attention, a little love. Yeah, just to be seen and to be heard and to be acknowledged. It's like yeah. those are big things. And, you know, that's to me why sports are so valuable and why coaches can be so impactful is, you know, when I think about hockey, I think hockey gives us a reason to gather. But the real impact comes between players, coaches, uh, other teams. Like when we – when we are able to maximize that opportunity to really get to see and acknowledge and encourage those that, you know, come to your place and work with you on their skills and come to my, come to my zoom room and help, you know, want to talk about things that are getting in their way. That's where the impact occurs. Hockey's just the reason to get together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found as a player that, uh, the team when I needed them the most was when I was struggling mentally the most, you know, I knew mm -hmm. that I, the only thing I wanted to do was to be by myself, but I also knew that the only way to get out of this as quickly as possible was to be around others and kind of have that pack of wolves mentality. Uh, Cause I knew that, you know, every team you're on, you know, that there's at least one other player <laughs> that's going through something similar that you are. If you're, you know, if you're at a point in time where you're struggling and if let's say the team's struggling, then that just compounds everything. You know, then, you know, you got it. You got a band of brothers <laughs> to deal, yeah. deal with things. Uh, did you find it the same way that uh, you, the teams that you played on were a source of strength? There were some teams that I played on that, that there was a number of, of my teammates that became my source of strength, but I was a loner. I was really ashamed of my struggles. I was really ashamed of my anxiety and my fear and my lack of confidence. And so I didn't really, I, I wasn't really comfortable being a mess in front of other people. And so I repressed a lot of my mess, which Later on in life, I had to come to terms with that. I need to deal with my fear. I need to deal with my anxiety. I need to deal with who I am as a, as a person. How am I going to contribute to society? How am I going to find my place? I mean, those were all things that, that were tough for me. And I was a loner. I wish I would have been more of a band of brothers guy, but I just, I just didn't do well in those situations. Well, you're going to have to uh, clarify something for me, and this is a, a perfect transition because if if I'm looking for someone to help me, I'm going to look for someone that uh, doesn't have to bag of crap that you got lurking around. You know, when when did you you know make the transition and and you know get the confidence and the wisdom to be able to do what you're doing now because once you make that shift now all of a sudden I'm I'm interested in you because you know you were in in the belly of the beast and you found the way out you know what I mean yeah well when I graduated from college in 1986 
I was fortunate to be introduced to a man that was a visionary for reaching out and helping hurting kids and their families. And it's a, it's a place in Minnesota that has five, I think, locations that's been highlighted on care 11 and, and all sorts of different places, but it's a place called Treehouse. And, um, when I was introduced to the man, his name was Fred Peterson, and he shared his vision about how he wanted to make a difference in the lives of young people. I was so captivated by it that I wanted in. I wanted to be a part of that team of people because part of it was I had my own hurting teen inside of me, but I also saw a vision for what was possible to work with other people. So the initial requirement to work there was you had to go through this seminar it was basically a personal development seminar where all of the people that were going to work with the kids and the families had to basically unpack their lives and go through some counseling and therapy and some healing in order to qualify themselves to even, you know, be a part of the team, if you will. So I remember going through that time and Lance, I got to tell you, it was one of the most refreshing, difficult, purging times in my life where I look straight at my greatest fears. I look straight at my greatest disappointments and the community of people that was in this seminar and the professional acumen of the people that were leading the seminar is really the breaking point for me to begin to turn some of the things that I was struggling with into my greatest strengths. And I spent 11 years working in that organization learned more about teenagers, learned more about people than I'd ever thought I would in, in that period of time. I uh, got my master's degree in counseling psychology during that time. I had to go through 10 more sessions of individual therapy. Uh, became a part of a peak performers network where I committed myself to becoming a lifelong learner. So I started reading books. I started listening to tapes. I started to use my car as a university library. So every time I was in the car, I was listening to something. And I've come to this belief and that is, and it speaks to your question. And that is, you can learn, you can go to, you can go to school, you can go get your graduate degree, but if you're not committed to the things you're teaching, like if I'm not, if I don't, if when I give one of my clients an idea of what they should do, if I'm not doing it, then it's just me passing on an idea. But if I'm doing it, I'm sharing an experience with them, saying this is how this has impacted my life. And I believe that, that for me to have the right or get the honor to sit in front of somebody and help them, then I owe them that I am doing my work every day to make sure that I am managing my emotions, that I am dealing with, you know, making amends when I hurt other people's feelings. I'm... I'm participating in my meditation practice and I'm doing my journaling and I'm doing my mental imagery. And I'm, I don't believe that you can be one person professionally and be another person personally. I think that, that who you are is who you are. And that's what you bring to the table, both personally and professionally. How does that saying go? How you do one thing is how you do everything. Yes, exactly. And I, I believe that. I believe that with my whole heart. And uh, that's why I'm so thankful for the people that invested in me. And that's why I feel such a debt of responsibility to pay it forward because um, there's a lot of really struggling athletes, struggling parents, struggling people who are looking for not just answers, they're looking for hope. They're looking for practical ideas that are proven to be helpful and somebody who can teach them in a clear, concise, specific way so that they can get the results that they're looking for. And what they're, if you really peel back the layers, we're all just looking to, you know, navigate through this life a little easier. And what I mean navigate is navigate between the years you know, our yep. self-talk and what's going on there and uh, to be able to, to, to be happy more days than we're not. Exactly. And 
I always tell parents, I go, if your number one goal for having your kids involved in hockey is for them to be happy, take them to an amusement park, take them on vacation, do those kinds of things, because those things are what might make them happy. But if you want your kid to grow and learn how to be fulfilled and learn self-mastery and learn how to deal with others and learn how to deal with failure, then put them involved in a youth sport and then, but give them the tools so they can navigate those moments because I guarantee any parent that you want a fulfilled kid more than a happy kid. Yeah. And I just, uh, I, I listened to some, some podcast or I was listening to some book or whatever, but, uh, it, this, it, you have to have struggle because after struggle, that's where the good stuff comes, you know, adversity. It, it, it there's, uh, example after example after example, you know, throughout time. But that's how it that that's how it happens. It, it goes hand in hand. Um, so when did you uh, break away from? You said it was the treehouse that you spent like a decade there. Yeah, I spent eleven years in the nonprofit organization where I was. I took on a lead. I took on a couple leadership roles, and then I ended up taking on a family advocacy role, and then. Uh, about 11 years into it, I decided it was time to make a transition into some other type of work. So I worked in a church for five years where I led small groups and, uh, you know, was a pretty significant leader in about a 1500 member congregation. And I got really burned out. And on vacation one week, I decided I need to figure out what my next steps in life are going to be. I read a book called Now Discover Your Strengths, which is a book every human being should read in my mind and took a little uh, profile or assessment, learned about myself and within a very short period of time decided I want to start the mental edge. I want to, I want to take what I've learned about young people. I want to take, cause really the kids that were struggling with drugs and the kids that were running away from home and struggling in school, they were lacking the same mental skills that the hockey players were lacking that, lost their confidence, didn't know how to deal with disappointment. They were lacking the same mental skills. So I thought, what can I do? I can help provide mental skill training to people doing something I love, which is sports. And um, the Mental Edge was launched in 1999 and been doing that ever since. Well, yeah, you, uh, you just wouldn't go away, would you, Sean? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's fun when you, when you, you know, take the plunge and not just dip your toe into it and you say, I, I'm, I'm all in. And all of a sudden you're, you're decades into it now. Uh, and I love that, you know, being an entrepreneur, when I retired from playing from the NHL, my number one objective was never to work for anyone again. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's, it's been awesome. So um, you're on your own now and there's the one thing, you, you know, we talk about you, some words, fear, anxiety, uh, mental illness, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. There's this, there's such a stigma and a black cloud, uh, that goes along with that, but there's been a transition now where instead of those type of words to describe uh, mindfulness, or, you know, working the mind. Now we got uh, mindfulness, mental toughness, meditation, uh, a, a new age of uh, a wording and phrasing. And I think that that's great. So let's kind of transition into that. That You know, I, I heard that, uh, read somewhere that as an athlete, you get to a certain point from a skill acquisition standpoint that, uh, your advancement it's it's more of the you know 90 for so long it becomes it's a physical thing that you're trying to acquire but you get to a certain point and then it becomes you know like 99 percent mental just being able to execute your plan at a high level consistently day in and day out it doesn't matter if it's practice or competition there's there's no doubt that that you know people put percentages on 
how valuable or how impactful is the mind. And I don't know how, I don't really know how people measure that. What I do know is, is that the better you get at something, the harder it is to get better. And, and the more competition that you face, the more difficult it is to have success because you're, you're, you're dealing with people who are at or above your skill level. And so your quote unquote results are harder to come by. And I think this is the, the crisis that a lot of hockey players hit. And, and part of it's, I think the culture that we, that we've cultivated. And that is the only litmus test that a lot of these players have to determine their success is their points. And if you're a goalie, it's your save percentage and your, and your goals against average. And so who gets rewarded every day with the players of the game are the ones that have the most points or have the most goals. And there's a whole slew of players that are now left without a framework for how they're going to judge or evaluate their own success. Yeah. And therefore then the confidence crucible comes, which is now, okay, well, I didn't score. I didn't, I didn't get a point. I haven't had a point maybe in a couple games. People talk about gripping the stick too tight, or they talk about playing with anxiety when really all this is, is, we haven't taught and we haven't done a good job of helping our young players understand that there's a lot of different ways to judge and evaluate your performance. And, and the process is what dictates the outcomes. And it takes a lot of small things in order to create an outcome. And, and so the mental aspect of it is figuring out how do I frame and interpret my results or my performance in a way that leaves me feeling valid, value, uh, uh, acknowledged, con- like I contributed, like I was important, like I made a difference, so that, so that I can now see progress within the context of what I'm doing instead of waiting for a coach to affirm me or waiting for a point in the game to uh, affirm me. And that's what, that's what I'm seeing, Lance. I'm just seeing so many young people that have what I call the confidence crucible where they really do not know themselves. They don't know their, what they're, you know, what they're, how they're contributing. They don't even feel like important because they haven't been taught how to judge and evaluate their own performance. Yeah, and I think the the other thing that's that's super important, um, and I wish I would have kind of figured it out uh, earlier in my coaching career, is that you know the the pain and the frustration and the anger, all these emotions that we have when you know going through a day, but when you play sports and you win lose, you got the peaks and the valleys that. Those are normal, and there's there's techniques out there that uh, can be learned to disrupt those those you know non productive negative thoughts, and that's really what we're talking about is is you know teaching kids what what to expect and parents let them know that this is all normal and there's ways for you to to manage it and to thrive in that environment. And I would, I would just say on top of that is that I think you probably can relate to this as a coach, but I get calls a week before playoffs or I get a call a week before tryouts and the call might go something like this. Hey, Sean, you know, son or daughter has got playoffs coming up or tryout coming up. Can we schedule an appointment so that you can, you know, help my kid have confidence or help my kid deal with, you know, the emotions or the anxiety that might come with tryouts. And in my spirit, I want to say, since when did you come to believe that confidence or emotion regulation or emotion management was something that you could, like, just accomplish with pure effort? We would never assume that you could learn to stick handle or learn to shoot or learn to skate by having one session. You have to train it so you don't have to try it so much. And, and, 
And so these these self-talking skills, these these emotional regulation skills should be treated in the same way that we treat the building of a muscle or the building of a skill set or the building of a hockey, you know, mindset. It should become part of a training program where you work at it with somebody who's really competent at training it to you or helping you understand how to train it so that you can have confidence in training, not in your trying. Well, talk about that, <laughs> excuse me, because that's part of your, your program. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, what is the training versus trying model? So a long time ago, when I first started, people used to, they used to think of mental skill training like signing up to see a therapist. You buy an hour and you go in and you spend your hour and you talk about your problems and then you leave. And then if you want to schedule another time, you know, six, six weeks later, you schedule another time. And then the, that appointment becomes like a pump up session for you. You know, I just want to feel better, but there's no skills that are being acquired. There's just uh, a moment where that person might feel better. And I started to realize that that wasn't the way I wanted to work. So I, I basically tell people that want to work with me that if you want to work with me, you got to make a commitment to doing it for three to six months up front. And the first thing I do is I make sure that I do an individual consultation in, you know, face to face with them where they can interview me and I interview them because all of my work is predicated on relationship. If the relationship isn't, solid, if there isn't a, a rapport that's been built, if there isn't a understanding of who they are and what they're trying to figure out, then, then I'm of no value to that person long term. And once that's figured out, once it feels like we got a good rapport, then I, I, I have a, an assessment that I'm one, of I'm one of only a couple people in the actual world right now that can utilize. It's a mental skill assessment. It's utilized by the New York Rangers, Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, we, I used to use it when Don Lucia used to have me come in and work with the Gopher hockey team. But but it really lays out in, in really clear, specific ways the, the way that an athlete processes the challenges that they're going to face and where their vulnerabilities are and where their strengths are. So I do that assessment. I interpret it for the parents, for the players, and then I build a personalized mental skill training program based off of that assessment. Okay. And the players that work with me either meet with me every week or they meet with me twice a month. And then I basically just take the, the skills that are needed to be learned. And every call that I have with somebody, I kind of, where are you at today? What's going on? What are the challenges you're facing? How did you... How did you apply any of the concepts that I taught you? Did you apply them? If you did, did you feel the result? Did you sense a result? If you didn't, how do we need to tweak it to make sure that you're getting what, you know, we're moving forward here. And then once that person shows some competency through their personal life experience, through maybe their coaches or their parents, then I move on to the next one and teach them a new thing. And, and, you know, 24, 48, I mean, there's people I've worked with for five years, uh, teaching, training, accountability. You know, I'm one of those people that I want to hear from you in between your calls. I want to know how you're doing. I want to know if you had a tough game. I want to know if you had a, you know, tough thing happen at school. I want to, so I think of mental skill training as uh, a regular point of focus around a specific skill that you are applying on a daily or regular basis in order to leverage that against whatever challenge you're trying to overcome. We're going to bounce around here a little bit and uh, very uh, thank you for those golden nuggets. Uh, yeah. Awesome messaging. And uh, we're just going to keep on diving into this. So you, you've had a lot of uh, time working with hockey players, hockey teams. And uh, as I mentioned in the, the intro, that most hot winter hockey seasons are uh, coming to an end. 
If they haven't already ended, they're going to be ending here soon. Uh, just give our listeners uh, some suggestions on what they should be doing now, because I just did a, a, a podcast episode on end of the season, postseason reflection exercises. Um, talk about that, and then what happens after you do that exercise as we prepare for for next season to start? Well, as a coach, you'll I think you'll uh, resonate with this. The first thing that a player should do when they finish their season is take some time off. I I think rest and recovery is kind of a lost idea in our sport world, especially our youth sport world, and especially from those that are really driven. And uh, so I always encourage the players that I'm working with who are involved in, you know, trying to get ready for their next year is to take at least two to three weeks off between their season ending and their next, their next, let's say season of training. Um, after that, I think that I don't, from a mental perspective, when I work with players, I want them to get feedback from the people that know them the best that have watched them. So I want them to know what did they do really well? What are their strengths? I want them to know what holds them back from competing at a higher level. And then I really believe that it's important to get around the right people to help them improve their skills. You know, in Minnesota, there are, there are some really, in my opinion, just best in the world type people at what they do. You being one of them, Lance, Scott Buchstead being one, and there's a bunch of different people that teach skating really well and uh, teach on ice stuff really well. But I really do think that as kids get older, they need to or surround themselves with a team of really good player development people, whether it be a skill set or a mental skill set. And then really lay out the plan. Like, what are you going to work on? What are you going to spend your time getting better at? Not just by doing, like, meaningless repetitions, but how are you going to challenge yourself in the area that you know is going to separate you or give you an opportunity to compete at a higher level? And go after that with vigilance. You know, challenge yourself to become a better skater, a better puck handler, a better shooter if you're a goalie you know, more explosive or read plays better, handle the puck better, whatever it is. But go into the summer or go into your off-season training with a specific focus, then a plan, break the plan down, and then become accountable to somebody for that plan. Uh, and I don't think that the person you're accountable to should be your parents. I think the person you're accountable to should be one of those one of those people that you're using or that you have brought into your life to help you become a better player and uh, a better person. Absolutely. So how important is writing down your goals, be it, you know, what you want to accomplish with hockey or, you know, you want to make a little change in your life. Like I'm not going to eat for me. I'm not going to eat chocolate life cereal anymore <laughs> at night. <laughs> At night when I'm watching Netflix. <laughs> but how important is it to, to write down goals and then can, is, is, can journaling and writing down your goals be the same thing? Um, so, number one, I think that, that one of the things I do with the players I work with is I actually teach them that there are a number of different types of goals. There are process goals, there are outcome goals. Uh, and those two need to under, you need to understand the, the relationship that those two, add, excuse me, those two have with each other. So uh, I think that writing, writing down goals, journaling on a regular basis is one of the most underutilized weapons in the high performance world right now. And most people think of journaling as just writing about their feelings. And there is value in writing about your feelings. But more importantly, you should be writing about the questions you have. You should be writing about uh, your fears. You should be writing about the hopes and dreams that you have. You should be writing about uh, the challenges that you're facing, the questions that you have. So I believe in guided journaling, Lance. I believe in 
writing down goals, but I believe a lot more in writing down your intentions, writing down the habits that you want to engage in, and then being accountable for those things. Because those things are the things that actually generate the outcomes. And I think it's more important to write about the process than it is to write about and worry about the outcome. Well, that's, I mean, proven. You, you, it can never be, like you said, an outcome goal. And, and it's all prop processes. That's what it is. It's a, you know, you're working your plan consistently on a daily basis. Um, so <coughs> journaling um, also... If we talk about your end of the winter season, um, reflection on it, you know, how, how, did you reach your goals and stuff? The, the journal can be a roadmap where you can go back and look and say, oh, remember how I felt after that tournament? We lost that uh, championship game. Here's how I responded. And then maybe uh, another tip is uh, you, you heard a quote or you read a quote or something. Throw that in your journal. Uh, and it really does create, you know, uh, a, a memory bank for you that you can go back and see what your mindset was at that moment in time in your life. Every player I work with, Lance, has a journal in order to work with me. Really? I, I don't work with players that won't journal. And some of them, some of them journal differently than others, but I... I believe that, for instance, so if I'm working with someone at the beginning of the year, I say, how do you know how to evaluate your play if you didn't have an intention about how you wanted to play? Yeah. So players always say, I want to play good, or I don't want to do this, or I don't want to do that. And I say, you know, to get your mind focused and to get your mind working for you, the first thing you got to do is have an intention before you play. I'm going to play fast. I'm going to play with speed. I'm going to forecheck uh, with, with some degree of aggressiveness. I'm going to shoot the puck. when I get... If you don't know what you're intending to do before the game, how in the heck do you evaluate how you did after the game? So the players I work with, they have to write their intentions. They put the date on the top, the team that they're playing, uh, their intentions for the game. And after the game, I encourage them to take five to eight minutes and give themselves a self-rating about how they performed their intentions during the game. On a scale of one to five, how aggressive were you? On a scale of one to five, how assertive were you? On a scale of one to five, did you show patience? Did you take good angles when you were forechecking? You know, did you shoot the puck when you had chance to? Did you shoot it with intention? And then they rate themselves on a scale of one to five. And Imagine if you had 30 of those kind of journaling assessments that you could look back at and say, what are the themes that are emerging in these assessments? Those themes become the roadmap for your summer training. Those themes become exactly – so journaling becomes a player's way to become part of their own coaching process so that they don't always need someone to tell them what they're doing. Yes. And uh, if they're not working with someone like you, that you, you're you going to give them some direction, uh, just plug into YouTube, Journaling for Beginners. Yes. Uh, and there's all kinds of great information. And the, the, the main thing, you know, same with like meditation. There's no right or wrong way to do it. it it's, the only mistake you make is, you know, when you don't do it. You know, the most important thing is to just start and try and evolve from there. Yeah, there's a, there's a saying now in the habit world of developing new habits that momentum is what's important. And there's this guy who wrote the book called um, Atomic Habits. And mm -hmm. one of his quotes, which I have hundreds of times with the players I work with, is you want to honor the schedule, adjust the scope. Yeah. So one day you, you never honor your schedule. I'm going to journal today, adjust the scope, spend two minutes writing a gratitude list and you're done. So there's, everybody has time to do all these things. It's just that their expectation 
and their all or nothing mindset gets in the way. So they end up doing nothing and never creating any momentum when two minutes here, 30 seconds there, five minutes here can create momentum. And before you know it, you have a habit that's actually supporting and helping your long-term goals. And when it becomes a habit, uh, you don't have as many inputs coming in anymore. You know, you're not right. thinking about it. You just, it's scheduled and you do it. That's why training is so much more important than trying because training requires, you know, such a small percentage of actual conscious thought when you play. Whereas if you're not training, then you have to use your conscious thought to do something that your training would have accounted for had you just started investing in something a lot earlier. Yeah. Oh, we, we could chat forever. <laughs> Love it. Uh, yeah. Before, you know, I got a few more questions for you. Um, okay. Do you have a big regret in your life that you wish you could take back? My, my greatest fear in life is to live a life of regret. And, and so, you know, there's, there's small personal things that I regret. Uh, but I, I, I really live each day pretty mindfully and pretty intentionally. You know, people say to me all the time, like, Sean, how do you have so much time to do the things you do? And I say, because I say no to about 95% of the things that come my way. So I, I don't really have many regrets that, you know, I really don't live with regret a lot. Uh, and the ones that I have had, I've actually made peace with. Um, but no, I don't have many regrets, Lance. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I don't either. I think that we, we aren't uh, where we are today as uh, middle-aged men, you know, without having some experiences and they're not all roses and some were great, but they all shape us. So uh, I wouldn't want to, you know, take anything back because it, it shaped who I am today. And I'm grateful for the, you know, where I'm at right now in my life. And I know you are as well. You know, when my, uh, my dad passed away a number three years ago and I remember, and I had a lot of animosity towards my dad. It was kind of the last kind of thing I needed to figure out in order to emotionally live with a little more freedom. And I remember writing a goodbye letter to my dad before he died. And I ended up having such gratitude for a man that decided to adopt me when I was eight months old, provided for me, gave me lots of experiences. I was able to actually tap into a whole nother way of thinking as an adult rather than as a child. And so if there was any regret, it was uh, not, I don't want, I didn't want to hang on to any anger or bitterness because that was only hurting me. And when I, when I read this letter to my dad before he died, uh, I just felt something that no other, I don't know how I could have ever felt that way. And so uh, that was the one thing that I did that, that I felt like, set him up to go and set me up to keep living. Powerful, man. Powerful. Um, all right. Someone wants to learn more about you, maybe uh, start working with you. Where can they find you? So my website is SeanGoodsell.com. My name's Sean is spelled with a U. And I offer anybody that wants uh, if they want to explore what this looks like, if they want to get to know me a little bit, they can just schedule a free coaching call. Um, I, I truly consider the opportunity to work with people as an act of service and uh, love what I do. So thanks for asking that question, Lance. Thanks for what you do to invest in the people that you, uh, you and I have known each other a long time. And um, I know what you're about. I know why you do what you do. Uh, and just appreciate your ambassadorship of the sport of hockey and the people that are in it. Well, thank you for those kind words, my yeah. friend. Um, I blushed a little bit, but you can't see that because this is just <laughs> audio. <laughs> uh, no, uh, this this was awesome. I, uh, you know, the more 
we're in front of a lot of people that, you know, if they play hockey, you know, that it, it's, it's an emotional game, you know, all sports mm-hmm. are and uh, everyone, they, they just seem, they want to bottle up what they're thinking and what they're feeling. And you have to, you don't have to go through uh, that is in, in a, in such a tough way. You don't have to ride the really bumpy road. You know, you can figure out ways to smooth that out a little bit to get through it uh, because everything kind of fades over time eventually. And uh, you're someone that has helped a lot of people over the years. So if uh, there's any, if there's any thing that I can do to help you, Sean, uh, you know, reach your long-term objectives, please don't, hesitate to ask. I really appreciate you being here. The messaging was awesome. And I hope that uh, there's someone that's listening here that uh, takes you up on that uh, free call and see if, uh, see if it's a match. I appreciate it, Lance. You want to hear a funny story? I love funny stories. So sometimes people I'm out on the golf course and they'll say, Hey, what kind of athletes and people do you work with? And I say, you know, I've had hockey players, football players, a couple basketball players and golfers. And so there's two really unique <laughs> athletes that reached out to me. And one just this last week, it was a saber fencer, a saber fencer. Yeah. So somebody who is fencing. Yeah. And I've never – I'm going to have to go and research what a saber fencer is or I'm going to, like, be absolutely out of my league when I have my initial call with this person. Maybe whoever's a healthy scratch on the Buffalo Sabres, <laughs> they're the ones that have to <laughs> fence with them. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. maybe it's that kind of – I don't know. But I'm kind of curious to see, you know, it's an 18-year-old young man who's a saber fencer who's looking to up his fencing ability – and I thought that was kind of interesting because I've never heard of that before. You know, it's it's my world has this been hockey, and I know you've had you know exposure to to other sports and stuff. But uh, I've had a few players that I've been uh, able to work with that have other passions, and one most recently she's uh, she's a horse jumper, and uh, it's just neat to see. Uh, you know, that you can have more than one passion, but uh, it, it's, it's a different world because we think we only know the hockey world, but it's equally as intense in the dance world, in the horse world, and, you know, all these other uh, uh, sports and activities that are out there. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's awesome that uh, a fencer found you because... <laughs> <laughs> uh if you can if you can take over the fencing world i don't i don't think you'll have any time for hockey players anymore <laughs> i had i also had a, a horseshoe thrower reach out to me a number of a professional horseshoe thrower she was 62 years old she wanted to learn how to manage her emotions better so she could win some national championships <laughs> hey and all we want you you have an objective i'm going to help you the best way i know possible to help you get there Absolutely. Yeah. That's all you need. Absolutely. That's all yep. you need. So, all right, my friend, cheers. Thanks for being here. Awesome interview. And until next time, have a great day. Thanks, Lance. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing about Sean Goodsell and the Mental Edge. If you're looking to dial up your mental game, check out Mr. Goodsell. I'll have a link to his site in the description. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.